Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 225. This week the questions are taken from Guide 265, the Guide to USS Bunker Hill, and the accompanying Wednesday video, Basic Fleet Tactics, A Thousand Years of Holding the Line. Now the first question from JJ Smith was actually asked last week, but I think it's a very important question, so I brought it forward. And he asks, how much time do you spend on average per question doing your research and writing up the answer, which comes in on the dry dock? And as a follow-up, how confident are you of your replies? Have you ever had a time in which you realised that an answer you posted was partially or wholly wrong? Now, in regards to the first part, the amount of time it takes to do research for dry dock questions can vary immensely. So it could be that there's a question I look at that and go, I already know what the answer to that is. It could be a question which I look at and go, I genuinely have no idea. And it might be a case of going to consult one of the books that's already in the library, or it might be a case of having to find out what books have the answer that I don't have, then ordering them, then getting them, then cross-checking those references, etc., etc. So, you know, it could be in terms of research once I've read the question. It could be anything from 30 seconds to quickly double-check that what I remember is correct, all the way through to days of searching through to find the appropriate reference which will have the answer in it and everything in between. Now, sometimes there will be questions, and this is kind of ties into the second part, how confident are you for your replies? Sometimes there'll be questions to which I can't find any specific easy answer, and I do try and qualify those. So if there's a question about, say, aircraft, I near enough always will try and remember to qualify it with, I'm not an expert on aircraft. Or if or you, if you hear another qualifier like, well, I think, or this is a matter of opinion, you know, those are questions to which, well, the qualifier states basically, I don't know 100%, but I I ha believe, based on what I've, I'm led to understand by various sources, that this is the case. If I just straight out say, this is why this happened, then those are the questions where I'm pretty confident that either I am 100% right, or at least the research that I've done has led me to conclude that this is my answer. And those two might be two slightly different things, because of course, on some matters, there are always going to be differences of opinion and differences of interpretation. Not on all matters, you know, there are some things that are just pure known fact, but sometimes I'll give an answer and I'm pretty confident you know, I can defend it with sources, I can defend it with reasoning, I can defend it with facts and figures, but someone will chime in will say, well, actually, I disagree, it's actually this, this, and this. And I look at it and go, okay, that's your opinion of how things go. That's not necessarily mine. We're presumably looking at the same evidence, so at that point it's a matter of interpretation. Obviously, I prefer my interpretation to yours, otherwise I wouldn't have said it in the first place. But this kind of also brings on a, a small, hopefully very short discussion about how things can be considered wrong. So you can have a case of lack of information. So, you know, I have X amount of information to hand. I base my answer on that. But perhaps there is additional information that I'm not aware of that might change the answer. So, for example, uh, take the UP rocket launchers. So, obviously, being a naval history channel, I will mostly know about the naval history of the UP rocket launchers. And so someone says, well, what happened to them? And I'll point out that they were fairly quickly removed over 1941 and 1942, when it became fairly obvious that they were far more trouble than they were worth. So that will cover the naval side of things. But then there was a land-based use of the UP system. And so someone might chime in and say, oh, yes, well, Drac, actually, they were used further on in this and this and this installation. It's like, OK, yes, that is a more correct answer as a whole, because it's the general system in use. But the information that I was giving was about the naval side of things. So it's not that necessarily either answer is wrong but both answers are covering slightly different things my answer covering as i said the naval side of things the other answer come chiming in with a expanded look at what they're also doing with land-based versions you also have times which kind of like as i said before where people just interpret the information very differently um, 
to use a, a hot potato subject, I guess, was Bismarck scuttled or not? There are people who are absolutely devoted to the idea that absolutely Bismarck was scuttled and and she wouldn't have sunk if she wasn't scuttled. There are people who are uh, obviously completely devoted to the idea that she was completely outright sunk by the British and she absolutely was not scuttled and everything in between. I personally am of the opinion that I find it very unlikely that she was scuttled and I don't think most of the available evidence actually you know fits the idea of an organized scuttling attempt however um, so while that puts me more towards the latter view although not completely I'm not uh, while I'm prepared to say this is my view uh, I and I will eventually do a video on it I'm not going to put a video out you know nailing my colors to the mast as it were until I've done more research to establish the exact fine details to back up my argument. But, of course, other people will turn around based on roughly the same evidence and say, actually, Bismarck absolutely was scuttled. At which point, you know, whose answer is wrong? We're presumably using the same evidence. It's not like massive new evidence has emerged in the last five years or so on the state of Bismarck and what the survivors did or didn't say. But, you know there are going to be peop a lot of people with a lot of uh, accreditation in both camps. So that might appear to be a wrong answer to your interpretation of the evidence, but then your answer might appear to be wrong to me, uh, my interpretation of the evidence. So that one's a little bit up in the air. And then, of course, you will have an answer where perhaps it is just completely wrong for whatever reason. Perhaps I've read outdated information that's been since supplanted and I haven't managed to catch up with the um, the new data. Or it's a question where I've made, made an educated, qualified guess um, because I couldn't find any particularly significant information on the fact. And I hopefully said at the beginning, you know, this is what I think is probably the case. And I my educated guess has perhaps been completely off the mark and someone with expertise in that field has chimed in and said actually it's this case so yeah that does happen on occasion and yeah sometimes as just said that i've looked at an answer and seen responses to it either by you know people emailing me or in the comments or whatever and then i've gone back over it and realized that perhaps something i've said was completely wrong now or partially wrong and if i've got something completely and utterly wrong completely off pieces like categorically provably the not a correct answer then i will try and acknowledge that in a future dry dock when i notice the issue and say well look i answered this before and i was wrong um where it's a partially wrong answer then i will usually either acknowledge the person's comment and possibly even also reply to it so that people who are looking in the comments will see, ah, yep, okay, this person said Drac is wrong. Drac has acknowledged their comment and said, yep, okay, that was that was correct. There was some part of the answer that was wrong. Um, and I'll do that if there's, a, you know, an element that was perhaps slightly off or an element where there's an equally valid interpretation, um, but where the substance of the answer is still largely correct. So uh, taking, for example, a, a relatively recent example, I misspoke when I was talking about the North Carolinas and their speed problems, which is something that's gone we've gone over quite a, a bit on the channel. Um, but I accidentally misattributed the position of the skegs on the North Carolina class. Now, the overall information I was giving about the resonance caused in the tunnel between the skegs and why this was a problem and you know why they were swapping propellers out and so forth and propeller design as a whole this was not wrong you know that information was correct the incorrect portion of the answer was misplacing where the skegs were um on the north carolina class specifically and people pointed that out in the comments and so i was like okay right well i'm going to like those comments and i'll acknowledge a, the the a couple of them so that people can see that yes okay i got that bit wrong but because the substantial portion of the answer in response to the question wasn't wrong i didn't feel a need to you know announce in the very next dry dock actually i'm going to completely revise the answer because if i was going to revise the answer then the only thing i'd revise is you know, literally two or three words about where the skegs are, uh, not that it changes the rest.
Now, there is one other if you like, variant on all of this, which is when people misinterpret what I've said and then they go off attacking what they think I've said, not what I've actually said. And in those cases, I generally won't bother responding because, uh, well, in, uh, in the best case, someone has just misheard and misunderstood, in which case going back over the question, hopefully they'll understand what I actually meant, and in the worst case, they're deliberately choosing to misinterpret it, to have a go, in which case that's not really a, any point in me actually responding, because they've clearly already made up their minds and they have their own agenda, and I've got better things to do with my day. And, I mean, an example I can think of from a, oh, quite a while back, actually, in terms of dry docks, was why the US Navy seemed to have a very eclectic naming designation system as compared to even the US AAF, the US Army Air Force at the time, because you know they had a P-47, which was a Thunderbolt, P-51, which was a Mustang, a B-17, which was a Flying Fortress, whereas there seemed, there you've got the F-4U Corsair, the F-4F Wildcat, um, and the F-6F Hellcat, but the F-4U Corsair is considerably more advanced than the F-4F Wildcat, so why are they both F-4 and so on and so forth? And my answer was substantially, you know, there's a degree of information contained in those uh, uh, designations, like you have TBF Avengers and TBM Avengers and so forth. But in my opinion, I don't think it's a particularly clear or useful naming convention system compared to what pretty much everybody else in uh, different nations, apart, uh, including or in the, within their own nation, the USAAF, did, you know, those naming conventions were generally considerably easier to understand um, straight off the bat. So, you know, obviously to somebody who studied it, you'll know the difference between an F4U and an F4F, but to the layman picking up a book, they might think that the two are variants of the same kind of aircraft. The only system that's even more opaque is, uh, you know, the Japanese system with the way they name zeros and so forth. But for some reason, somebody with a bee in their bonnet decided that this meant that I had said the US Navy didn't have a naming convention or naming system at all, um, which is just a bizarre interpretation of things. So, yeah, why would I bother responding to that? Now, that's run on for a little bit, so uh, this dried up will run on for a little bit because I don't want that to crowd out the, the rest of the questions, but it was an important qualifier anyway. UNSC Forward Onto Dawn asks, with the exception of its destroyers and a handful of light cruisers, why did the US Navy not follow the Royal Navy's example post-war of selling off many of its larger ships, i.e. cruisers and carriers, to Allied navies? Was it simply a case of wanting to keep as many ships in reserve in case of a new conflict, or were there other reasons? So there were a mixture of reasons, some of which was that a lot of the US ships that went into reserve were fairly large and fairly crew-heavy. So, for example, uh, when the Canadians were operating their carriers that they bought from the British, they did look at one point at operating Essex class, but they came to the conclusion that the British light fleet carriers that they were using, um, first the uh, Colossus, the Majestic, and then Colossus or Colossus and then Majestic, whichever way around it goes, they required far less crew than an Essex class would. And so for a small navy who obviously didn't have a huge amount of manpower, it was better to use a, you know, a slightly smaller carrier, but the one that required far less crew than one that they couldn't man in the first place. And that's coupled with the fact that a lot of the US cruisers and carriers and so forth, etc., that were left can basically be roughly divided into two groups. Most of the pre-war stuff had either been lost or had been run pretty hard during the war and really wasn't in the best of shape to be sold to another navy to conduct you know long-term operations so you know the omahas for example pretty much are done um the new orleans class similarly are pretty much done and then you have the war built stuff Cleveland's, Baltimore's, etc., etc., and they kind of fall into the same gap as the Essexes, 
in that they are quite large, quite manpower intensive ships, therefore not necessarily suitable for smaller navies. And that's why you see some of the older stuff like the Brooklyns being sold off because they are somewhat less manpower intensive. Also, and this is the other factor, because you might argue that crew difference between a Brooklyn and a Cleveland isn't too huge. The other thing is the US was, and to a certain extent still is, very sensitive about transferring its technology. And of course, because it had been able to mass produce things like uh, fire control computers and radar and etc., they'd been able to refit a lot of their ships with their, at least what at the time in the late 1940s was the latest and greatest tech. And given that you were, you know, a few years out from McCarthyism, they were a little bit sensitive about potentially giving some of this stuff to people who may deliberately or inadvertently let that technology get out to other people. And the ones that you could trust the most amongst it, the sort of Western allies tended to also be people who were getting their stuff from the Royal Navy, like the Australians and the Canadians. Um, and also the other thing is when you look at what kind of stuff the Royal Navy was selling off, you know, you had the light fleet carriers from the 1942 onwards program, which as I said, are pretty much the lowest crew complement reasonable size carriers that you're probably going to find and then you have leanders didos or didos um crown colonies etc and all of these again are either in the case of the leanders and the didos sm the smaller cruisers can or the arethusers for that matter also the smaller cruisers compared to the towns and the crown colonies are diminutives of the towns. so once again they're mostly on the smaller side of things, therefore they need less crew, they're less expensive to maintain, and they suit smaller navies better. And that's why, you know, US destroyers were very popular with people, because destroyers don't require a particularly huge amount of crew, and the US destroyers, compared to everything else uh, in the larger classes, actually struck this really nice balance of being quite large for World War II, but that meant that they had the space and capabilities to be upgraded with a certain amount of systems that made them somewhat viable combatants for the cold war and so people you know liked to have uh, a lot of those and to be fair the u.s had an awful lot of those to let go there were however a few cases where something larger did get shaken loose in the case of the independence class a couple of them went to france on what was effectively an extended loan because the u.s got them back at the end and this one which has been gracing your screens during the answer um this was ex-uss cabo that went to Spain, originally like with the French ones on an extended loan, but was eventually later sold to the Spanish and, as you can see, operated for a considerable amount of time. So there were the occasional larger technology and ship transfers, but generally speaking, most of the US stuff was basically just too large, too manpower intensive for smaller navies to have a substantial number of when there were smaller, less expensive options available combined with the fact the US has been a little bit guarded about transferring its latest and greatest electronic tech. Christopher Babylon asks, what were some of the upgrades that they would have done to Bunker Hill and are there any pictures of it? There aren't any plans that I know of that are publicly available of what the ultimate configuration of the Essex class would have been, which is what the US Navy was saving Franklin and Bunker Hill for. Um, if they have been released, obviously, because this would be 1970s-ish, probably or late 60s, early 70s. So if anyone who covers that period of history in more detail knows of them, then you know, please let us know in the comments. If they were still classified for some reason, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me. But as you can see from this picture, the Essexes that stayed in service or were brought back into service went through all sorts of interesting upgrades. And the basic purpose of having Bunker Hill and Franklin in storage was having been reconditioned to what would have been the as-built at new configuration as it stood at the end of World War II and the US Navy was looking at them and looking at the other Essexes and essentially going well we've got all these iterative upgrades going on we've got these two essentially factory fresh Essexes in storage so once we eventually decide on what the ultimate version of an Essex should be, then we will upgrade these two straight to that without the intervening you know, issues that might occur. 
and then we'll have a pair of really capable smaller carriers compared to all the supercarriers. But over time, as more and more supercarriers came online, and of course the US carrier fleet switch started to switch over from conventional to nuclear propulsion, the need for it and the expense that would be involved gradually dropped off uh, further and further and further. So you can find photos of um, Bunker Hill and Franklin from the late 60s, early 70s, and apart from the little sort of mushroom domes over the AA mounts and everything, they essentially are near enough pristine World War II vintage Essexes. But if they were going to do the the final upgrade, it would probably look something like um, the SCB-125A configuration you can see there on the far right. But as I said, that's very much a Cold War period of history. So if anyone knows if any if the US Navy ever did draw up an ultimate Essex plan, please let us know below. Kurumi asks, if you were going to build a 35,000 ton treaty compliant battleship, what would you go for? Would it be something like the Richelieu's with good speed and decent armament, South Dakota's with good firepower and decent speed and protection, or the KGVs with a good overall balance, or something completely different? So it depends which treaty I'm trying to comply with, because of course uh, there's London treaty compliant, um, because Washington, basically the building holiday, unless you're France or Italy, um, runs through and past the London treaty. So there's London treaty compliant, which is 35,000 tons and 16 inch guns. There's second London treaty compliant, which is 35,000 tons and 14 inch guns. And then there's escalator clause invoked uh, treaty battleships. And bearing in mind the 16 inch and the uh, above 35,000 ton are two separate issues. So that kind of reverts back, you could argue, reverts back to 35,000 tons and 16 inch guns before it goes all the way up to 45,000 tons and 16 inch guns. But if we're going to, I'm going to assume a first London treaty compliant battleship or an immediate uh, post escalator compliant battleship because. Basically, I don't like the 14-inch gun. And that's because my chosen configuration for a treaty-compliant battleship would look very much like a Richelieu. The only problem with that is that it limits me, with a pair of quad turrets forward, to eight guns. And on a mid to late 1930s battleship, I don't think eight 14-inch guns is really going to cut it. The King George V's kind of got away with it with 10, although they were ideally designed with 12. But if I'm going to be limited to 8 guns, then I would want 15 or 16 inch weapons at the very least. And the reason I choose the Richelieu style arrangement is basically, I think, well, the all forward layout that still has efficiency savings that recommend it to squeezing the most out of a 35,000 ton battleship. So if I was going to pick and choose from everybody's available weapons for treaty era battleships i would probably go with the us 16 inch 45s um, arranged in french style quad turrets i.e two twins in close formation um, per turret and that's largely because the us was the only one who actually got you know a 1930s 16 inch gun working uh, the lion's guns theoretically may have worked but they were never deployed operationally i would Put them in, as I say, two quad turrets forward. Um, I would take the, the magical French machinery that allows you to squeeze a huge amount of power into a relatively small space. But unlike the Richelieu's, which use that to get their speed up as well, I would use at that to have a smaller machinery space and settle on 28 knots, because I think that's perfectly fine for a treaty era capital ship. And then using the weight that I've saved off of that, combined with the weight I've saved off of having the all forward armament, I would then increase the armour protection to something closer to a King George V level of armour protection if I at all can. And I'd probably see if I could get the two quad turrets closer together as well to ensure even better weight savings in terms of shortening the citadel. But that would be my solution. Basically a 16 inch 45 armed Richelieu style, although slightly rearranged gun configuration battleship that's capable of 28 knots with thicker armour and a true dual purpose secondary battery, whether that's 4.5 happy pancakes or twin 5 inch 38s, then I, I'm not particularly fussed, but that would be my ideal 35,000 ton 
treaty warship. Josh Thomas Moore asks, I've heard a few claims that the Death Star's alarm-siren is a naval one. Is this true? And if so, which ship is donating its alarm? So it is a bit of an interesting question, because there is no naval siren, alarm, alert, etc. that I'm aware of, at least from the period the channel covers, that sounds exactly like the Death Star alert signal. But there have been various suggestions over the years as to where it might have come from. Um, And a lot of people have suggested it's taken from a submarine diving alert, which the, the length of the tone, I can kind of see why you would say that. But pretty much all the submarine diving alerts that I've heard tend to be they, they don't have as clear a tone. They tend to be have a bit more, I guess, vibration. I don't know what the exact audio term is. But anyway, this is the Death Star. And something about that triggered a memory, either of potentially a siren I'd heard in real life at some point, um, or possibly in a documentary, or possibly in a movie. And I looked around, and I eventually found what I think was the one I was looking for, which was the alert that was used on smaller Royal Navy vessels, um, you know, corvettes, destroyers, etc., etc. And there's a recording of that. Now, there are a couple of problems with this. Obviously, the, the individual alert blasts are considerably shorter, and they are somewhat higher pitched but you can probably hear at least some family resemblance involved there. So I thought, okay, given that it's a sound studio and, you know, Star Wars was quite inventive when it came with to developing a lot of sounds, you know, blast sounds and lightsaber sounds come from some of the weirdest and least likely places. And so I thought, well, what happens, given that I'm just using my video editing software here, so not a full dedicated audio suite, but what happens if I just extend that um i think that's a corvette's siren so that the waveform roughly matches the time of the death stars alert so we get this and then i thought okay well let's go into the big file of audio effects most of which i have no idea what they actually mean and throw on a couple of the likely ones give it a bit of a play around and that comes up with this and now compare that to the professionally produced So, you know, given that I threw together that modified Corvette siren thing in about five minutes, as I said, using a piece of video editing software uh, that's not really designed for audio stuff, and I haven't run it through cleanups and so forth, I think, you know, a professional sound maker, even, you know, back in the 70s when they didn't have full computer suites, etc., I have a feeling probably found either a recording or an actual alert siren of some description that was found on you know, small craft of World War II. This particular one's from a Royal Navy Corvette. But given that the Corvettes and frigates ended up in service with the US, Canadian and British navies, amongst others, probably wouldn't be a huge surprise to find one hanging around in a American studio back lot or in a, you know, a portfolio of standard stock sounds. And so, yeah, I think they probably took one of those blasts, not of that particular blast, but one blast similar, and just did some extension and modification to it and well you hopefully you can see why i think that let me know in the comments below if you know different or you think that i got relatively close doxon asks why were no heavy ships used by the royal navy during the dunkirk evacuation wouldn't they have provided good anti-aircraft and shore bombardment support whilst being much more resistant to dive bombing than the destroyers and transports evacuating the troops there were a wide variety of reasons some of which was just the evacuation happened and was organised over a very short, rapid period of time, so a good chunk of the Royal Navy's larger assets were just physically not in in range. Um, there was also the fact that it was an evacuation, you know, it was the end of a significant phase of the fighting, 
And even during the evacuation, the Admiralty actually withdrew some of the more modern destroyers that it had initially on evacuation duty for future defence. So they didn't see much point in throwing away even some of their bigger destroyers in uh, an, in, an, in an operation that ultimately was only going to be one stage of things and would, you know, ultimately, they thought, lead on to potentially having to stave off uh, a seaborne assault on the UK and or general other operations to support the war effort. Plus, the um, larger ships generally couldn't have gotten close enough to the beaches to evacuate soldiers um, and... A large warship is less efficient at transporting troops than a dedicated troop ship, transport, freighter, liner, etc. That obviously has considerably more volume in it. And it was fairly clear that stationary warships, which is what the large warships would have had to have been, either coming up on the mole or to you know stand out to sea and then receive smaller ships shuttling people back and forth, that would have made them sitting ducks for incoming attack. Now, yes, in theory, they would have more anti-aircraft firepower and more armour to deal with it, but that wasn't necessarily going to be a guarantee. And when you look at the ships involved in the Dunkirk evacuation, uh, as far as records go, there were 15 ships with a displacement of greater than 3,000 tonnes involved, including actually the anti-aircraft cruiser Calcutta, and over half of those were sunk. And a good chunk of what was left was hit and damaged. So the Luftwaffe was prioritizing the bigger ships and also um, dedicated warships. So, you know, the highest casualty numbers in terms of ships hit and sunk are amongst those 15 ships above 3,000 tons and amongst the destroyers involved. So if you sent in cruisers or battleships, you can guarantee the Luftwaffe would swarm them disproportionately, and that A, leads to a much higher chance of them being lost, and B, if they're lost with you know as many troops as you can stack on them, fitted on onto them, that's going to be an utter disaster on multiple counts. So it, it just basically, it wasn't worth it, Com uh, in terms of the risks involved to everybody plus of course the fact that it was a relatively narrow part of the channel that the evacuation was going on going along meant that the smaller craft could just make trips there and back uh to from the uk to france and and back into the uk again with a relative degree of ease and, you know, the amount of time that a ship would have to be stationary and exposed whilst people were being ferried to and from it, it really would put the ship at far too much at risk. I mean, Calcutta, as we said, was a dedicated anti-aircraft cruiser at this point, and even she was hit by incoming uh, Luftwaffe bombers. So th there were a number of different reasons why the heavy ships weren't present. Paul Peterson asks... We see the famous picture of what's possibly a mackerel drawn against the side of an English race-built galleon. What always bothered me about that picture is that the outline of the ship looks nothing at all like the outline of the fish. Were there parts of the ship that lay below the fish belly so narrow that they didn't count? Certainly towards the stern, the stem of the ship is very narrow, um, to the point that it's basically it's not hull, it's more of a projection from the hull. And also, obviously, this is a you know a a theoretical um, kind of principle of design, and b it's not exactly the world's best drawn fish, and there are a lot of fish in out there in the sea, quite literally. Um, so, yeah, it, it, this illustration was more to show the general principle of design, but broadly speaking, you can actually see the influence of. Um, well, obviously experience in building ships, but also experience in the imitation, of, I think it's biomimetics, the imitation of living things in technology when it comes to the appearance of warships in this period. So when you look at a fish from a top-down perspective, assuming we're talking about the general kind of fish you find in the sea, you'll notice that they have... Ironically enough, um, for a thing that is optimised for travelling underwater, a kind of spindle shape to them, i.e. relatively bluff 
bow, if you like, quite rapidly swelling um, to sort of a widest point at about a third of the way down their length, and then gradually narrowing and tapering away uh, to the back. Uh, unsurprisingly, with things like the R-class submarine in World War One and then the Albacore in the post-World uh, War Two period, this turns out to be a remarkably efficient shape for travelling underwater. Who would have thought? Um, but when you look at what's available of the the wrecks of ships from that period you can actually see a roughly similar hull form this is actually really noticeable if you go and see mary rose now i'm kicking myself because i was at mary rose last week and i didn't take uh the necessary photo but especially when you're looking down the length of mary rose's wreck from the bow you can actually see pretty much exactly that same pattern of uh, you know widening out about one third of the way down the ship, and then gradually narrowing up, and with of particularly with Mary Rose because obviously her wreck is basically a half wreck, so the internals are exposed. You can see the volume of the hull, the lower hull, actually very closely following the general body plan of a fish, with the um, aft as as you mentioned with this. Um, you know, mostly being a construction. It's the physically there, but it's a construction that's not part of the inner hull or the inner volume of the hull itself. Plus, of course, a ship has to be on the surface, not underwater like a fish is, and therefore there are also going to be some slight alterations to accommodate the necessity to stay nice and upright uh, when a substantial portion of your structure is out of the water and that's what most of this kind of the keel and the stem work is that's not part of the sort of the volume of the hull is mostly there for stability and guidance. Jeff Bybee asks at Jutland Jellico had to decide whether to form line to port or to starboard and picked port but had he gone straight ahead or an echelon would his his firepower still not have been heavier than the high seas fleet. If he could have got his 25 ships in five lines of five into line abreast or even a crescent, then whichever way the Germans turned, they weren't going to lose contact. Plus, would it not have taken less time? Now, the problem with Jellicoe going straight um, is probably best exemplified, as you can see here. This is one of the pictures I took of the entirety of the Jutland battle that I took for my video on the Battle of Jutland. But as you can see... This is kind of the position just before the deployment. So you've got 5th Battle Squadron there kind of uh, at about the 10 o'clock position trying to join up. BT running across the face of Jellicoe and 1st Scouting Group and elements of the High Seas Fleet approaching at the bottom. Now, the problem with Jellicoe keeping his ships in their column and then running straight in their columns and running straight at the High Seas Fleet is that you can see there he's got six columns and potentially a fifth battle squadron hauls in there, he's got a seventh. But that then means that as he engages the Germans, given the rate of closure and everything, he's probably going to end up with first scouting group, which to be fair is probably still going to be messing around with what's left of the battle cruiser fleet and third battle cruiser squadron, at least at first. But then you're going to have the Kaisers and the Koenigs which are then going to be roughly speaking, because they're obviously going to be making a turn to starboard at, shortly after this point, um, they're all going to be broadside on. And all the ships that are further back in the column are not going to be able to really bring their firepower to bear. So you're going to have, at best, the forward firepower of seven ships versus the broadside firepower of seven ships, which means that the Germans are actually the ones who have crossed the Royal Navy T. And that's before, you know, the um, the Helgelands and the Nassaus, which would be bringing up the rear, would be able to bring their fire to bear against 5th Battle Squadron and the starboard most division of the Grand Fleet. And as the engagement progressed, then elements of 1st Scouting Group and the lead elements of the High Seas Fleet would be able to concentrate against the port side column of the Grand Fleet. So the Germans would actually be in a position to bring considerably more firepower to bear if Jellicoe stayed in columns. If he ran straight at them in columns and then tried to deploy later, uh, once he's you know, hit hove into sight of the fleet, then he, of the German high seas fleet that is, then he's going to face additional problems. Apart from the sort of slight chaos and confusion that the deployment caused anyway, 
You've also got the fact that, again, the leading British ships are going to be at a firepower disadvantage until they can get their broadsides clear and the second ships, at least in line, can also bring their broadsides to bear. Plus, the because obviously the, to turn, there's a certain turning radius and everything's going to be a lot closer. It's going to be hugely attractive for the German torpedo boat flotillas, i.e. their destroyers, to run in and fire torpedoes at them, because A, they're a lot closer, and B, if everybody's deploying, then each column is having to turn about a point, which means that they can look and see, okay, well, the first ship's turned about that point, the second ship's turned about that point, we'll fire torpedoes at that point, and maybe those torpedoes won't get there till the third or fourth ship has passed, but the fourth or fifth ship in line, um, probably the fourth, is going to take a hit or two with the torpedoes, and, and or, you know, we can see they're all going this way, therefore we'll just fire ahead of that turning point, and we're guaranteed to hit a bunch of ships because the only other alternative is to break up formation, which would possibly be even worse. Um, forming them into a line abreast, that might give him some advantages compared to staying in column. But again, it restricts the ships to their forward firepower only, whereas the Germans would have their broadside firepower to bear and still runs the fleet headlong into the possibility of torpedo attack, which Jellicoe is quite nervous about. Um, a crescent, sort of a descending crescent, might work, because you can sort of cauldron the Germans in fire, um, which it would be a, almost in some ways a slight adaptation of what actually happened with the uh, battle line deployment. But the, again you're risking torpedo attacks on the leading elements of the Crescent, and you would also have an awful lot of crossfire, because the uh, you know the ships on either wing, well, the ships at the heart of the Crescent are still going to be restricted to forward firepower only, and the ships on the wings, which can bring their full broadsides to bear, are only going to be able to bring that to bear on German ships that are basically on the other side of the Crescent. So shells are going to be flying left, right, and centre. It's going to be very much harder to spot. Um, and as I said, because the center ships will still be limited to forward firepower, the overall firepower advantage of the Grand Fleet is significantly lessened. Yes, in theory, a crescent of attack probably would result in Sheer not being necessarily able to slip away, but it could also lead to Sheer having localized superiority over one horn of the crescent or the other. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why Jellicoe didn't go for that tactic. I think if he was going to go for any specific tactic other than the one he did, then perhaps one of Admiral Sturdy's suggestions might have worked. But as I've mentioned in another um, dry dock, that would have been a very high risk, high reward scenario. Mr. Gravana asks, were any fire ships used in fleet actions against a formation with ships tied together? As far as I'm aware, the modern use of fire ships, as opposed to the ancient, often on occasionally recorded uses of fire ships, that doesn't seem to have coincided with ships tied together. The sort of ships all tied together to fight a land battle at sea seems to be, at least again in the sort of the post ancient era, seems to have largely been a thing in the migration period what some people call the viking age and then into the early medieval period and fire ships don't really seem to have featured all that much in that time period unless you're talking about the byzantines with greek fire and then once you get to fire ships coming in in if you like the modern use of fire ships with the armada and the anglo-dutch wars and everything by that point people are fighting gun duels and not tying all their ships together so the two seem to have kind of skipped each other. Although some fire ships were used when ships were kind of grappled together or shortly after they'd grappled together, which does involve the use of ropes. So if you count a fire ship that attacked a ship that was in the process of boarding or being boarded by another vessel, then technically, maybe. Ben Smith asks, I heard the other day that direct turret hits on ships in World War II would tend to send the guns straight up to maximum elevation. What causes this? Is it even true? It's actually broadly not true. Um, there are a few notable cases where it did happen, um, or at least a damaged turret was left with its guns pointing straight up. Bismarck is perhaps one of the most 
famous as seen here but even then you can see the guns of Tarrant Anton are you know down and the guns of Caesar are basically just frozen in the last position that they were at. Now most of the time when you see damaged turrets on battleships the guns are actually pretty much at either just frozen in the position that they were in when they were hit or they are actually all the way down and that's basically because and quite often if the hit is bad enough to cripple the turret it also tends to cripple the hydraulic systems that are used in a lot of gun turrets to elevate those guns upwards so for example um, Lutzau which was following Blucher in during the uh, Battle of Drawback Sound that actually took a hit to that system while it was um, heading in just after Blucher was hit and that severed the hydraulic lines and the guns all just flopped to their lowest possible elevation and stayed there which was one of the reasons they had to break off because they just could not bring any of their forward main guns to bear because they wouldn't elevate anymore um if you're so if you're using a system which is basically using continuous positive pressure from an active hydraulic system and the turret gets hit and disabled and that system is breached the guns will just fall to their their lowest possible setting if you're using a system where the gun's elevation is locked in place by some other means um, then they'll just lock in if you, you know, disable the system it'll just stop wherever they are it's possible occasionally for a gun to run all the way up to maximum elevation but that would tend to happen either when the gun is partially unseated from its uh, cradle but not so much that it just falls off so if the point of balance of the gun is changed then it might run all the way up um, another potential would be if the system loses pressure and the gun was perfectly balanced empty and perhaps is loaded so there's a slight bit of weight um, aft of its point of balance then it might run up in that in that particular case um, or if for some bizarre reason the gun is um, overbalanced at, uh, towards the back i.e. if the gun is left in its left without any other interference it would swing upwards then obviously if all other systems and interlocks are disabled then up it goes but I can't imagine why you'd want to do that unless it was forced on you by some other necessity of design because that means you have to have a continuous positive pressure system to keep the thing down which is where the guns normally rest switch 374 asks what did the columbus expedition take to eat and drink on their first voyage how close were they to running out of food and drink and perhaps more interesting what did they prepare and take for food and drink on the return voyage so we actually know quite well what the ships of columbus's expedition would have been carrying with them as food so some of it is you know fairly standard what you might expect um pickled and or salted meat uh, beef and pork that's the standard stuff um wine in the case of the spanish world because they were a major wine producing re region rather than um, beer or later rum as you might find on english ships um, they also carried a degree of fresh water uh, until it ran out um, because they had wine aboard they also had vinegar they also had olive oil mediterranean climate of course they're going to be carrying that uh, but then as well as you know cheese and hard tack which again were common pretty much across all sailing ships from europe at the time they also had a number of other things so they're listed as taking molasses honey raisins uh, rice garlic almonds um, sugar legumes um, specifically chickpeas lentils beans of various sorts as well as a significant amount of salted fish now that sounds like a considerably more varied diet than you might find on uh, perhaps a british warship of the 18th century and to a certain degree you're right there's certainly a lot more different ingredients in there however um an awful lot of that would basically just all be boiled up into one big broth or stew or whatever you want to call it and then you just ate that so weirdly enough despite the significantly greater variety of individual food types it sounds at least from the records that the spanish sailors were basically eating the same thing day in day out for a large part until of course you had unique things happening like the water running out or 
um, certain of the salted meats running out, and then you'd have to subsist on just specific elements that you had left. Now, as far as how close were they to running out of supplies, apparently, well, from all known accounts, they were pretty close because Columbus had catastrophically miscalculated the size of the world. So if the American, North and South American continents hadn't been there, and of course he didn't actually land on them in on his 1492 expedition, he hit one of the Caribbean islands. Um, but if they hadn't been there, his crew would have, well first probably killed a bunch of themselves in a struggle for food and water and or wine i suppose at that point and then everyone else would have starved to death fairly shortly thereafter so they were very lucky um in terms of food and drink for the return voyage obviously they were out of pretty much everything they'd taken with them so they stocked up on everything they could find locally initially the locals shared some food with them and then afterwards it was more a case of taking whatever they wanted Brian Smith asks, How hard was it to get professional historians and others to take you seriously and not just some fly-by-night YouTuber? Um, not that hard, but also very hard at the same time. Um, now, there's a reason for that slightly ambiguous answer. Basically, when I started the channel and then when it started you know, growing to the format that it is in today, initially... I didn't want to risk approaching any major historians precisely in case they thought, oh, well, what, who's this guy? He's got, you know, a couple of hundred followers. He's been around for six months. Why, why should we pay much attention to him? So I wanted to let a body of visible work build up first before I was confident in, you know, contacting the, the authors, the PhD wielding academics, etc., etc., uh, and you know, asking if they would be kind enough to either help me with information or, as you've seen um, in various guises, appear on the channel. Now, obviously, then letting that body of work build up meant that I had to keep to fairly strict standards and, um, uh, you know, make sure I got my information pretty much spot on, which is what I wanted to do anyway. But it was kind of also a bit of a sword of a Damocles hanging over my head of, you know, if you ever want a a serious historian to take you seriously, then you have to make sure that it's always as close to accurate as you can possibly get. But, so that's the hard, I guess that's the kind of the hard part, if you like. Then, when it came to actually contacting them, I would say the 99% of all the professional historians and authors that I've contacted have both been incredibly polite and friendly and have also you know that because there's that body of work to look at they've either for some somehow they already know of the channel um or they look into it and they go they've pretty much all gone yep we i'm i'm happy to be associated with this person um so that element of things has actually hasn't been too difficult at all and uh you know it's in a lot of ways it's been f fairly similar with people who have previously served in the navy and know a lot about the history of the navy that they served in um, again they've been able to look at the body of work or they've already been fans of the channel and they've just gone yep no this is this is something i i would like to be associated with or you know i can i can put in an appearance here and that's not going to discredit me in academic and professional historian circles so you know between that and, as I said, the fact that the vast majority of them are incredibly nice people, it's once once the first, I guess, once the first few elements of contact were done, I was somewhat less nervous about contacting others. And generally, it's as I say, it's all held fairly good and fairly true. And in a lot of ways, that also helps me. Um, when it comes to thinking about where I sit in terms of things uh, when it comes to naval history, because you will inevitably get people who, you know, will spout off on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc., and rant and rave about how I'm the worst thing ever and I'm some kind of evil, dark, malign influence and um, so on and so forth. Uh, one of them near as no, near enough has made no difference called me the dark lord of of youtube that is ruining naval history to uh, didn't particularly appreciate my response which was basically okay i'll start building the tower of baradur then um 
yeah, some people just can't take a joke. But I have noticed, by and large, that the people who really fly off their rocker and start ranting and raving about me, or the channel, I guess, um, tend to be... What's the best term for them? Because the thing is, I don't want to say necessarily say the Facebook historians, because there are a number of actual legitimate historians on Facebook, and there are people whose main history output is on Facebook who are pretty good at what they do. Um, but... I think you, prob you probably get the idea, you know, people who, they have a reputation for knowing something about naval history in their own little group, which is basically almost exclusively online and, you know, largely, you know, a, a self-selecting small pool of people um, who don't necessarily, most of them, if any, have any actual qualifications um and so you know you, you can probably get the kind of profile of person that i'm thinking of at that point and because they're a big fish in a small pond and quite often a big fish in an echo chamber they feel free to rant and rave about basically how they know everything they are god they are the best thing since sliced bread and everybody except for them is wrong and when I kind of look at that and compare that to actual published historians, authors, etc., who are perfectly happy to work with me, I kind of go, yeah, I think I'm going to take the latter group's opinion over random person on the internet. <laughs> um, and it's especially since, you know, some of these people will then move on and in, you know, the next breath will also claim that every single, you know, published author and historian who disagrees with them is also wrong because apparently they are the greatest and why isn't anybody listening to them and why is nobody you know giving them book deals and why is nobody listening to them and it never possibly occurs to them that the answer could be one of two things or possibly both either one you're just a really unpleasant person or two you're wrong <laughs> Or maybe both. But no, that can't possibly be the case. You, oh, I can't possibly be wrong on the internet. It's everybody else who is wrong. <laughs> anyway, minor rant aside, um, and looping back to the original question, most professional historians, I say 99.9% .9 of all professional historians that I've interacted with, have been completely professional and perfectly happy to talk to me in a serious manner. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't see them appearing on the channel. Robert Henry Ilston asks, you mentioned your bottom five or bottom four carry conversions. My question is, why were these conversions so bad? I understand that normally a purpose-built ship would be better, but I guess I'm asking what engineering dash design decisions made during the building process or in the whole selection process made these conversions so bad? It can be a whole range of factors depending on which conversion you're looking at in particular. In, I mean, conversions, as you mentioned, inherently usually have significant inefficiencies versus purpose built. So for the same displacement of hull, or the same length of hull, whatever, you're going to get a less capable carrier than one that's purpose built to that same size and displacement. But beyond that, you have some carrier conversions that try out or are forced to use um, particular layouts, which badly affect their carrying capability so hms furious which is guest starring as the cover page for this particular question for example has these internal trunks which exa exhaust all the air out uh, from the boilers out the back and that's not great because it takes up a huge amount of space in the hangar compared to courageous and glorious although ironically of the three furious is the only one who survives past the opening stages of world war ii um you can also have something that's just too slow or too small. Um, now, being slow, i.e. lower end of the 20s of knots, doesn't necessarily preclude you from conducting flight operations. Some of the escort carriers are good proof of that. But it does preclude you from perhaps carrying out some of the heavier air operations. Um, too small, you know, length to beam ratio is definitely a thing because... Longer flight deck uh, 
means you know aircraft have a longer run up to take off it's safer to land them you can perhaps conduct takeoff and and landing ops at the same time if absolutely necessary and generally a, a very long ship assuming that it's not absolutely insane on the length to beam ratio will have a fairly substantial hangar space as well so if you're using a sort of a short stumpy ship then you're going to have a fairly limited flight deck so your ability to conduct air ops is limited and you're probably also going to have a fairly small hangar um, another point when it comes to carrier conversions is that whether you're looking at carriers today or carriers back in the interwar period or world war ii there are certain sweet spots of size and displacement which are ideal for carriers and if you start to stray outside of them you actually get a lot of limitations now of course if you're designing carriers and from the ground up and you know about this or you can calculate it then you'll tend to have carriers that hit those approximate kind of sweet spots assuming that you're not massively hemmed in by treaty restrictions or something like that but when you're converting a ship you're very often left with you know whatever the ship hull that you have available is for your conversion work and that hull will have been designed to completely different purposes either as a liner or as a surface gun based warship etc and so it might come in in one of those kind of dead zones where you don't actually get all that much for the additional size and displacement that that you're using um, and a lot of this comes down to in part length of flight deck but also in terms of your beam because if you're really small you might get if you've got um, fixed wing aircraft for example you might only get aircraft in your hangar one abreast um, but if you've got folding wing aircraft if you can make that hangar a little bit wider you might get two lines of aircraft in but then if you make that hangar progressively wider obviously as the ship's dimensions overall are increasing you're just getting still two lines of aircraft with a little bit of extra working room around them for quite a while until you get to a point where suddenly you can now squeeze three lines of aircraft in so in terms of your beam which obviously is going to dictate to a certain extent your hangar width then a hole that's in between these two and obviously exactly what those two beams approximately are going to be is going to vary depending on the time period you know uh, an aircraft carrier that can get aircraft in three abreast in 1925 might not be able to get them in in and might only get them two abreast in 1945 but you, you know, get the idea um you know if if you've got a ship that say can get two and a half aircraft across with folded wings well that ship might be you know 40 50 percent greater displacement than a ship that can just about get aircraft into a to a breast but you're only getting about the same amount of aircraft in which means that you know a lot of that extra displacement is just pointless waste now you might have slightly roomier hangar decks therefore to work on the aircraft that might give you some slight advantage but the chances are that if you're converting you know an 18,000 20,000 ton heavy cruiser into a carrier and you're getting a flight group that's about the same as somebody who's converting a 10,000 ton cruiser into a carrier well the people who are building the 10,000 ton cruiser can probably build two and convert them into carriers and get double the amount of aircraft compared to your single much larger vessel and there's also structural issues so if you're converting a liner for example a liner will have been built to a certain set of stability curves and with a certain amount of strength in its hull now granted you're cutting off a lot of that superstructure but you're also installing a bunch of other superstructure that may be you know per square foot somewhat heavier than the superstructure you've removed plus you're putting in aircraft and munitions etc etc so a civilian liner conversion whilst they might be relatively large and relatively fast might not actually be quite as efficient as you think and then of course a warship will be built to carry a fair bit of top weight anyway because it was designed presumably to carry guns and heavily armored turrets the flip side of course being that they tend to be per displacement because they have armor and so forth slightly smaller 
than an equivalent liner. So it's all swings and roundabouts, but you can get some really bad decisions being made in terms of you know getting a a ship that either displacement or size wise is kind of in the middle of one of those sweet spots um and perhaps is relatively lightly built so can't be particularly heavily overly built to carry significant numbers of aircraft anyway and then you end up with you know all sorts of problems or you might end up with something with a relatively short length to beam ratio um, which again is limits limits your flight operations from short flight deck so yeah th there's all sorts of combinations of factors and not all of them apply to every bad conversion um, and some of them some bad conversions have lots of them and some conversions theoretically you might look at and say well that could be a major issue but they have other things working in their favor that actually makes them work considerably better uh, for example the lexingtons their overall hull shape meant that their hangar was not necessarily as efficient as it could be um i mean they had a reasonable beam at amidships but because of their origin as battle cruisers their hull was overall quite fine so you couldn't have a full width hangar the full length of the ship um or a good chunk of the length of the ship the hangar sort of trended down a little bit whereas if you'd had perhaps a slightly different design of battle cruiser or with a different hull form or a comparable length ship that was designed for something else like ocean liner work etc you might have been able to get a larger hangar on the same length but the huge length of the flight deck helped them and the fact they were just colossal in the first place for their time uh, meant that even if the um the whole form meant you had a slightly inefficient hangar deck it was still a really really big hangar atomic Bretonic asks we hear a lot about how certain navies did very well in world war ii and it just so happens that those navies were also the best supplied and best organized and the navies that did the worst generally won't give a fair chance either due to lack of resources or the government choking them for every penny my question is what navy did the best with what they had maybe won the most battles with a handful of ships or inflicted the most damage with the least amount of ships sections of big navies would perhaps also fit such as the royal navy's indian or mediterranean fleets and what navies did the worst i think if you divide it up into time segments as well this kind of helps because obviously on the allied side you've got primarily the royal navy and the u.s navy who are fairly large <laughs> fairly well supplied fairly well organized albeit both of them had had various bits of penny pinching um, during the interwar period but if you want to look at smaller navies that you know either didn't have a lot of resources period or were quite choked off by their government in terms of funding well the french navy it's not really fair to look at because they only had you know about a year or so before that france bows out of the war for the most part so yeah looking at the achievements of the vichy french navy is a little bit unfair um because they had very very limited stuff to work with and similarly you know you've got the greek navy the dutch navy the norwegian navy the polish navy all of which have you know a few months of combat operations before they lose their homeland and are forced to subsist on you know what what they can get so you know, say looking at what they accomplish although it can be very impressive is again somewhat unfair because they don't actually have their home base to work out from um, although with that said uh, the dutch submarine elements in the western pacific did exceptionally well um, during the opening stages of the pacific campaign against japan and generally speaking you know, as a whole what dutch submarines there were tended to be fairly effective but if we look at um let's say the the axis navies the italian navy the german navy and the japanese navy the japanese navy does very well in 1942 as a whole now obviously there's coral sea and midway and they do end up towards the end of the year losing guadalcanal as well but end of 1941 and then through most of 1942 
the Japanese Navy is actually doing surprisingly well in terms of numbers of ships it and types of ships that it manages to sink um, or badly damage versus the ships that it loses, with the exception of the big set piece like Midway. Um, you know, by the end of the year, they actually have more and arguably more capable carriers available than the US does. They've still got both of the Shikakus, they've got both of the Heos, they've got a range of smaller carriers, whereas the Americans are down to, well, they're down to theoretically two, Saratoga and Enterprise, but Enterprise is desperately in need of, of, of repair. Um, the air wings are a different matter. But when you look at overall the battles around Guadalcanal, yes, they lose Kirishima and Hiei, um, but in terms of cruise, the cruiser and destroyer exchange, generally they're getting the better of it. And certainly with ABDA command, the Japanese definitely get the better of that. But then they run into the problem of, if, which is pretty much mirrored in their air groups, of if you have a core of highly trained, highly experienced, in this case ships, who are built around fighting a specific kind of warfare, then they will tend to do very well initially but as the losses build up and that experience drains away and more importantly the ships drain away and you can't replace them you suddenly end up on a downward spiral and so kind of post 1942 the japanese navy is on you know a fairly significant downward spiral which to be fair is kind of kicked off by in large part the guadalcanal campaign if you look at the Italians, the Italians, broadly speaking, do pretty well for what they the hand that they've been played. Um, they're a smaller navy. They have admittedly the advantage that the Royal Navy and then later on elements of the U.S. Navy are somewhat distracted by the existence of the Kriegsmarine and the and then later on the Imperial Japanese Navy. But especially in the early stages of Italy's involvement in the war. The Italian fleet is certainly nothing to be dismissed. You know, the, the British funnel a lot of forces into the Mediterranean to keep it. Control of the Mediterranean swings back and forth a lot. And what ultimately really stymies the Italians is not so much allied efforts, although obviously they are making significant efforts and they are gradually grinding down the Italian fleet, which has similar problems to Japan in that it it's very difficult for them to replace lost ships. But the bigger problem that the Italians face is fuel. And, um, as time goes on, their fuel reserves are running lower and lower and lower, which means that they have to husband their ships and their fuel stocks to fewer and fewer operations, which of course allows the Allies more and more operational freedom, which gradually, along with you know, the operations themselves will tip the balance of power in the Mediterranean well into the Allies' favour, and then, of course, the Italians bow out of the war. So, much like the Japanese, the Italians have a good start, um, but peter off towards the end, albeit in the Italians' case, that's more more just because they're flat out running out of fuel than necessarily running out of ships. There's certainly a lot more surface combatants left to the Italian fleet once the Italians signed the armistice than they were to the Japanese when the Japanese surrender at the end of World War II. The Germans are another kettle of fish entirely. There is obviously a very clear distinction between the U-boat arm and the surface elements of the Kriegsmarine. Uh, the U-boat arm's successes continue significantly further on indeed you know mid sort of mid spring early summer 1943 is generally held to be the point at which the balance finally tips against the u-boats whereas in terms of surface warships the german major surface fleet operations are pretty much done by early 1941 essentially at uh, kind of at the midpoint of bismarck's voyage is probably the high point of German surface operations. At that point, of all the big gun ships, so that allows us to rope the Panzer ship into this, um, you know, they've sent out multiple voyages of Deutschland Dash Lutzau, Admiral Scheer, Scharnhorst, and they've just sent out Bismarck. And okay, they've lost the Graf Spee fairly early on, but out of all their other big gun ships, although they have been torpedoed, they've been mined, they've been shelled, they've had to run away a few times. They still have 
everything. And in exchange, they've managed to sink Glorious. Obviously, the Shan Horse managed to pull that one off. Um, they've managed to sink Hood. Bismarck had just pulled that one off. And they hadn't, you know, Shan Horse, Gneiser now, Bismarck, they were all still afloat. Uh, Tirpitz was just commissioning, and the other two Deutschlands were still floating around. But pretty much the end of the voyage of Bismarck is the start of the end for the Kriegsmarine's um, surface units, because obviously then Bismarck goes down, so that's kind of Hood is lost, Bismarck is lost. Um, the Germans don't get any operational carriers, so there's not a direct match for Glorious, but then after that you have the Channel Dash, which isolates the Scharnhorsts in Germany, as well as resulting in heavy mine damage to both. Gneisen now obviously never comes out of the dock, thanks to RAF bombers. Um, Tirpitz, as a result of those two big losses, ends up holding up with Scharnhorst up in Norway, where Scharnhorst is then knocked off by Duke of York and friends. Tirpitz is bombed by 6-1-7-9 and nine squadrons. And ironically enough, um, Lutzau and Admiral Scheer are the only heavy-gunned German surface combatants that survive well into 1945, although both of them end up being tall void as well um, towards the end of things. So, But at the same time, compared to the Italian surface fleet actions generally, and the Japanese as well, um, the Kriegsmarine's surface fleet doesn't really ever take off in terms of its offensive potential because you know their their first big opportunity for glory is norway which fair enough okay yeah they get glorious but they also have the heart of their cruiser and destroyer fleets ripped out of them and the Scharnhorst sent into dock with torpedo damage so by the time of the battle of britain and the threat of in potential threat of invasion and so forth there really isn't all that much in the kriegsmarina that's really suitable for escorting invasion convoys Kevin Weber asks, I'm oddly fascinated by streamers, the immensely long banners flown on upper masts of some age of sail warships. My first thought were they were a quick glance method of determining the vector of the wind speed and direction of the ship. But the web says that they were to show the rank of the commanding officer of that ship. So why so long? It seems like they might get tangled in the upper rigging at times unless overly long depictions are art artistic license and they seem to have been in vogue for a relatively short period of time. What say you? Now, this one I'm pretty sure I can actually answer from my reenactment background. Now, you probably will be aware that in the medieval times you had coats of arms, which you know still carry on through this day, but coats of arms were very important to people because they were a method of identifying who you were. And they could appear on surcoats or jupons that you'd wear over your armour, uh, they could appear on shields, and they could appear on a variety of other things. However, um, whilst these could appear on fairly square flags or banners, there was another kind of personal flag. Now, if you go and look at Jason Kingsley's excellent Modern History TV channel, um, he has a video he published four years ago called Medieval Battle Flags, What Were They Like and How Were They Used? And in that, you will see the long much much longer form of the medieval battle flag or banner that people would carry and this would often combine multiple elements of their heraldry their national allegiance etc etc uh, the french also had one called the oriflamme which was as the name suggests mostly red um, with a golden sun on it which they would fly as a signal that they were going to show no quarter in the battle that they were about to engage in ironically enough most of the time they flew the oriflam it usually ended in a defeat for them so perhaps flying a no quarter flag at that point wasn't the wisest of things but never mind and these long banners were very distinct to the upper echelons of society the noblemen and so forth and kings obviously now, at the same time, as you move into the sort of the Tudor period and shortly thereafter, which is when you see a lot of these flags, as you can see in this depiction of Henry Grasseddia or Great Harry, the people who were put in overall command tended to be the upper echelons of the nobility, um, like Lord Howard of Effingham, put in charge of the English response to the Spanish Armada in large part on account of the fact that he was an upper echelon nobleman with some relationship to the sea, um, rather than being the best necessary seagoing commander. But he had the good sense to defer to the ones who really knew what they were doing. But nonetheless, 
when these nobles went out to sea, well, they already had a personal heraldry that they could use to identify themselves to everyone else, which was this long banner. And so, obviously, the kind of long banner that you'd carry on a horse is going to look fairly small and pathetic on a large ship, so you just make it even bigger. And when you scale it up, you get stuff that looks like this. Now, granted, some of the stuff on the anti-roll is probably a little bit over-exaggerated for effect, but that's where I'm pretty sure the general principle of these long banners comes from. And so, effectively, it's medieval heraldry at sea. In this particular case, it's flying the uh, a green flag with the cross of St. George on it, which is the Tudor Channel Squadron flag. But, yeah, there would be issues with these things. Um, partly the length potentially could get tangled, partly also the fact they're very long, but they're not actually that tall, which can make it fairly difficult to you know, work out exactly what they're saying or what they're p depicting. Um, you know, the fact that a, a long but relatively narrow banner on a horse allows you to depict enough stuff for people to see what you're doing on a land battle where, you know, you're looking at it from tens or hundreds of yards away as opposed to on a ship where you're looking at it from hundreds to thousands of yards away. It would also mean a lot of the fine detailing was lost, even if it, the banner was flying pretty straight and true. And so people began to figure out, well, actually, if we make these um, much shorter but more rectangular banners or flags, then they we can actually depict things somewhat more simply and somewhat more clearly. And that's where you get the jacks and the ensigns that come to dominate uh, flag waving aboard ships from then on. And that's the end of this video um, as far as user questions go. So thank you very much for listening. Now I'm just going to append this with a bit of channel admin, which I haven't done for a while. Uh, there's another question that was raised relatively recently, which is that the questions now being answered in the dry dock are from quite some time ago. Um, you know, the guide to HMS St. Lawrence last week, the guide to USS Bunker Hill this week are from near enough a year ago. Now, the reason this has happened is actually a function of how the dry dock works, because each week I take questions from a previous week's set of videos. So in theory, everything should keep pace. However, obviously, at the end of each month, there's also the Patreon dry dock. So effectively, we lose one week because I don't want to just skip over a week. And so for every four to five weeks of dry dock content, we step back one week in terms of how far distant the sources for the dry dock are at, questions are actually becoming. And inevitably, this is just going to continue. So we do face a little bit of a problem because the questions that are being answered were asked a very long time ago. The flip side is I don't necessarily just want to arbitrarily skip ahead um, because if I do that, then there's going to be whole swathes of pin posts for Q&A where people have asked questions in good faith in the hope I might pick them. And they're not even going to get a look in because I'm just skipping over them. And of course, some of those videos are, have some very, very interesting questions on them. But it would mean that I'm answering questions that were asked, you know, at least, you know, three, four months earlier or possibly even soon, maybe a month or two ago, which would be a bit more proximate to their being asked. So I put it to you, uh, dear viewers, um, how would you like me to source questions from the dry dock going on? Would you like me to continue the way I'm doing it at the moment? Would you like me to skip, you know, almost a year's worth of questions and just go, well, sorry, you'll have to re-ask them now? Or do we want to come up with some other kind of alternate solution? And if you have an alternate solution, please suggest so in the comments below. Um, one solution that I thought of was... Potentially, although this would limit the chances of any individual question in an individual video being answered for a short period of time, but one potential way of dealing with it would be for a while to for me to source the questions from multiple weeks worth of videos, maybe two weeks worth of videos give the questions for one week's dry dock. And that would allow me to catch up because then if we take a typical four week month, then I'm answering six weeks worth of questions plus the Patreon dry dock. So I'm actually getting closer to now by half a month every month. 
And that, to me, might seem a little bit fairer than just skipping entirely, because although it would mean maybe only taking two or three questions from each video, it would mean that there's still a chance that a question asked in each video would get answered, as opposed to just outright skipping over them. Um, of course, as I say, the alternative is to just take four, five, six questions from each video and just let them keep going further and further back in time. But in any case, um, since you are the guys who are asking the questions in the first place, I thought it only fair to let you guys have an, a, a say in how we do this going forwards. And of course, at some point, if, if I do, say, for example, do the two weeks worth of questions in one week's dry dock, eventually I'm going to catch up to maybe a, a month or two behind where we are now, at which point I can then go back to one week's worth of questions per dry dock until the gap opens up a little bit. In any case, thanks for listening. Let me know what you think and see you again in another video.